Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the courage of freedom. Freedom can be a soaring sound, like a military band marching down Fifth Avenue. And freedom can be as soft and warm a sound as the humming of a mother bending over a cradle. Freedom can wear dignity and greatness, like the Declaration of Independence. Or, as you will hear in our story, freedom can even wear an insignificant and rather funny hat. Our story is entitled, Freedom Wears a Funny Hat. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Young men of America, do you hear that sound? That's the sound of one of America's newest defenders of the American way, an F-89 Scorpion jet, an airplane that travels faster than the speed of sound. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, if you've had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, you are eligible to become a part of the jet age in the aviation cadet training program that the United States Air Force is making available. Visit your United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station as soon as possible and get full information. Don't hesitate. America needs you. Now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Freedom Wears a Funny Hat, a story based on an actual incident from the pages of American history. It was the year 1657. It was the Dutch colony on what we now call Long Island. It was Indian summer, and Governor Peter Stuyvesant was bored, extremely bored. Oh. He scrawled his name across a parchment. He yawned mightily, scratched his nose, sniffed, and said, Bring in the prisoner, John Bone. John Bone! John Bone. Remove that monstrosity which you laughingly refer to as a hat. Not to any man. I said take it off. Not by my will, sir. A simple way to remove a hat is to remove the head it sits upon. The action would be yours and not mine. And so the guilt. Do you think for a moment I would not take such an action? I think you'd welcome the opportunity. Then doff your hat! No. That I will not do. Are you stupid or just stubborn? I am neither. I'm merely a man who respects God and is humble only before God. I'm a Quaker, a friend. Take off your hat, friend. No. God! Rip off his hat! Well, now. How do you feel about that, John Bone? I feel pity and compassion. And sadness. But only for you, sir. Only for you. We would be historically wrong to say that all the trouble started because of the fact that John Bone refused to remove his hat. Although said hat does enter the story in more than a minor capacity. 
No, the trouble began brewing long before this meeting between Governor Stuyvesant and John Bone. It started with the hanging of a placard on the wall of a tavern in Flushing, Long Island. It was Christmas Eve, 1657. Young man, would you have the kindness to do an old man a favor? Well? The placard you have just nailed to the wall. What does it say? Can't you read? Yes, yes. But not this collection of inky hen tracks known as Dutch. I don't mind to turn you in for that statement. Well, now, that's unusual, isn't it? What? Turning you in? No, having a mind. Yeah, it was my impression that all you Dutch have endorsed your minds over to our most excellent governor for safekeeping and pasturage. Now, uh, translate that placard. Is it another impost, another beastly tax? It's an edict from the governor making it illegal for any resident of the colony to entertain those called Quakers on the premises. The fine is 50 guilders. Ooh. <laughs> Today we must not entertain Quakers. And after that, no doubt, we shall be proscripted from entertaining men with moles on their left cheeks, followed by a ban against third cousins on the maternal side. Your tongue will get you into trouble yet, old man. Perhaps. But tyranny afflicts me like an itch. And I find the only way to get relief is to scratch it with my tongue. You'll scratch yourself to the gallows. Well, now, that too is an excellent way to relieve an itch. This town of Flushing that we've mentioned was hardly a town at all. Some clapboard houses, a tavern, a landing stage, such was the town. As for the people, they were almost all Englishmen, refugees from the religious persecution of the old land or the bigotry of the new. They came to Flushing because of the promise of liberty of conscience without molestation or disturbance from any magistrate. At least, such was the wording of the patent granted to the town by the West India Company of Holland just a few years before. And now, the placard. The townsfolk, of course, held a meeting the night the placard was hung. It is this, or it is nothing. It is all. Or it is nothing. We have settled this Tobias Feek is the orator. As it is said in the Bible, a tall, spare man with a face that looks like an exclamation point in brackets. Children. We have done this for a promise. A promise of liberty. Now it is a case of what is given being taken. This we cannot suffer. This we cannot permit. Speeches, always speeches. The prisoner condemned to the block moves the onlooker to tears with the power of his word. So what happens? The axe comes down just as fast and the head rolls just as far. Enough of your speeches. What then can we do? Fight back. Fight Governor Stuyvesant? Why the devil himself, for truly they are the same. Here. Edward Hart, our esteemed town clerk and scribbler par excellence. Have you a quill sharpened and a spot of paper handy? I have paper. Uh, then write as I say, and write fast, because my bile is flowing fast. Are you ready? I... Right honorable. You have been pleased to send unto us a certain command that we shall not receive or entertain any of those people called Quakers because they are supposed to be, by some, seducers of the people. For our part, we cannot condemn them in this case. Neither can we stretch out our hands against them to punish, banish, persecute them. For we desire not to judge, lest we be judged. Neither to condemn, lest we be condemned. But rather let every man stand and fall to his own master. Do you have that, Clerk Hart? I have it all. Wait now. Do you have the insanity to believe we dare send such a document to the governor? Do we dare not to send this document? Do we dare to stand bareheaded before his wicked authority and bow and scrape every time he eats not well and issues another edict? Listen. We petition. We are free men and we petition. This remonstrance is not 
so much a denial of his power to legislate our minds as it is an affirmation of our holy right to defy that power. We will send the remonstrance. The governor's reaction was just as you would expect. Get me the ringleaders. Throw them into jail. Find them. Run them out of the province. Offer a reward to all who give information on those who follow the Quaker sect. Enough of these heresies. I'll have no more. Set them up an orthodox minister and tax the inhabitants of Flushing for his keep. The English. By my soul, the Lord made the English only to test the patience of the rest of the world. Yes, the governor's reaction was just what you would expect. But five years later, in 1662, the governor received a magistrate of the town of Jamaica. It is my duty, Your Excellency. My duty, you understand? I do this only because it's my duty. Does the fact that a reward is offered for this information make your duty any the more digestible? Oh, perish the thought. But not the reward. Waldron. Excellency, our good magistrate has come with certain intelligence that should interest you, Sheriff. Tell him. Uh, well, now, uh, I have heard more than that. I know it is an absolute fact from... Uh, Personal observation. He spied on them, that's what he means. Uh, yes, I investigated the matter personally. In Flushing, sir, there's a man named John Bone who follows the abominable Quaker sect and holds meeting in his house every Sunday. Bone, you say? Aye, Bone. His spelling is B-O-W-N-E, John Bone. Your order, sir. Bring him in, of course. <laughs> Through due course of the law, the governor's law, John Bone was held in the guardhouse near the gate of the governor's home. The next morning, as the governor passed on his way to his office, he heard a voice call. Your Excellency! Governor Stuyvesant. Sergeant. Sir? Is someone addressing me? A prisoner called out, sir. What prisoner? I see nothing but a hat sitting on a head. The most ridiculous hat at that. Prevents me from seeing more. Your Excellency, Sergeant, I... will you be good enough to explain to the source of this disembodied voice that His Excellency the Governor is normally attended by certain courtesies, the most meager of which is the common decency of a removed hat? Take off your hat when you talk to His Excellency. I'm sorry, but bearing my head is an act against my conscience. All men are equal, and no man is in station above another. Sergeant, did I hear some further talk? The prisoner says he can't bear his head because of his conscience. It must be a wicked conscience that must stay hidden beneath a hat. Your Excellency, I have my convictions. What? Did I hear something? He has his convictions. To which, no doubt, I shall add one of my own. Will you hear me, Your Excellency? It's strange. Is it not, Sergeant, that a hat can seriously affect one's hearing? Injustice, Your Excellency. Sergeant, Excellent. I perceive that we are being plagued by an apparition that hungers for justice. I suggest we lock this ghost in our deepest dungeon until I pursue further the proper procedure against discourteous phantoms. <laughs> With pleasure, Your Excellency. Your buckler, Sergeant. Straighten it. It sits awry. Yes, sir. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Freedom Wears a Funny Hat. Our story will continue in just a moment after this important message. Young man, there's a future in flight. Today's jet age offers unlimited opportunities for young men between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half who have completed two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified. Yes, you can proudly wear the silver wings and fly the mighty aircraft of your United States Air Force when you've completed your training. For full details, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. Remember, the sooner you apply, the sooner you fly. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, 
And now we present the second act of Freedom Wears a Funny Hat. The governor is a man we mustn't judge too quickly, lest we, as they say, be judged ourselves. The good governor was a man of his time, a brave fighter, an honest administrator, and a total bigot. In due time, his conscience got the better of him, and he decided to see John Bone. You remember what happened then. Take off your hat, John Bone. No. God! Rip off his hat! Oh, now, how do you feel about that, John Bowen? I feel pity and compassion and sadness. But only for you, sir. Only for you. Your pity is not needed, and save your compassion and sadness for yourself. John Bowen, how do you plead to the charge? I have heard no charge. Then hear it now. Sheriff, read the charge. John Bone, you are accused of being a member of the abominable Quaker sect and of housing members of this sect under your roof in unlawful assembly. How do you plead? I plead the charter. The charter? The patent granted to the town of Flushing by your predecessor, William Keeft, contained these words. The settlers are to have and to enjoy liberty of conscience according to the custom and manner of Holland, without molestation or disturbance by any magistrate that may pretend jurisdiction over them. Do you think I am not familiar with the wording of the charter? I think you've overlooked it. I overlook nothing! I am here to preserve peace and not to tolerate heresies. What is despicable about saying that one man is all other men's equal? It is not true. You condemn our beliefs, sir. Do you understand them? This is infamous. Well, what do we say that is so infamous? We say that a person finds God within himself. That every man and woman is ordained at birth into a priesthood of common worship. And that the pulpit is the right of every person desiring to preach the way of the Lord. We take no oaths, sir. We have no professional ministry. We do not doff our hats. That is our belief. You are threats to the peace. You rouse the rabble by your preaching on the open streets, in barns, and wherever you find an audience. We threaten no peace. All we ask for is peace. Plead to this charge, and let's have an end of this. I plead to nothing. Your final word? The Lord will have the final word. You will find the sum of 150 guilders. I will not pay it. The fine shall be 300 guilders for the second offense and banishment for the third. I will not pay it. Take him away. This way, Bone. Bone. Yes. You forgot your hat. <laughs> 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 There followed now a time of uh, furious inaction. John Bones sat in his cell, his hat firmly on his head. The governor matched stubbornness with stubbornness. The first month, he kept Bone in a dungeon on a diet of bread and water. Then he thought of a better strategy. Move him from the dungeon to a room in the city hall. Feed him well. He thirsts for martyrdom, the fool does. So we shall persecute him with kindness. Bone sat, hat on head, just as firm in the city hall as he had sat in the dungeon. Enough of this. I'll have the poor idiot off my hands. Tell him I will remit his sentence if he promises to leave the province. Enough of this farce! Bone would make no such promise. Leave his door unlocked. Let him sneak away in the night. John Bone was in his room the next day when the guard peered through the unlocked door. There's no way of ridding myself of this nuisance. Send him back to Flushing. Tell him I grant him the pleasure of his family for three days. Or that will be the end of John Bone. 
Two hours before his deadline, John Bone waited outside the city hall. I want him off my neck! The whole town's laughing at this comedy, and at me. I say, it's enough! Bring John Bone to me. We'll have it out this time once and for all. Bring him to me! Now then, Bone, let us talk this over man to man, good humor, and with clear sense. I will pay no fine. Pay nothing. Only leave the province. That I will also not do. And just what will you do, if I may be so bold as to ask? I will stay where I am until you acknowledge the freedom of all people in this province to worship God in a manner of their own choosing. That right is granted, Bone, to all but Quakers. Freedom is not a thing divisible. It comes to all equally, like air being breathed. If you deny freedom to one, you deny it to all. That is not true. It is true. When the good people of Flushing sent you a remonstrance, you flung their leaders into jail. Bone, you have said enough. No more than should be said. You shall be packed off on the next ship to Holland. I wash my hands of you at last. <laughs> In Holland, that little land of large tolerance, John Bones spoke before the Amsterdam Chamber of the Dutch West India Company. To their offer of freedom for Bone and his family in Holland, his reply was brief and very much to the point. I cannot think that you in sober earnest believe that I would subscribe to any such thing. It being the very thing for which I chose freely to suffer want of the company of my dear wife and child, imprisonment of my person, the ruin of my estate. This I did rather than yield to such a thing as you require. Wherefore, I have this now to request for you. That the Lord will not lay this to your charge, but give eyes to see and hearts to do justice that she may find mercy with the Lord in the day of judgment. And this speech the chamber meditated until their chairman took paper and pen and scratched thereon a short, curt note. Yes? Yes, come in! Don't tear the door from its very hinges. Uh, Your Excellency. Well, what is it, Sheriff? Tremble as though you just come from seeing a ghost. Well, what I have seen would send a ghost shrieking. Indeed. And what, pray, is this ghoulish apparition? Bone. Ah, huh? Bone? The same. Where? Here. Here. He waits just outside. Why, my soul. The Quaker has the courage to return to face me. Well, show the friend in. The friend? Show him in, I say. Uh, yes, Your Excellency. John Bone, His Excellency bids you enter. Close the door. I wish to be alone with this man. I'm pleased at your safe return, friend. Was your voyage pleasant? A voyage home is always pleasant. I have with me a note from the Amsterdam Chamber. Note? It is addressed to you. May I have it? Thank you. Hmm. Ah. You, uh... You are familiar with the contents of this message? It was sealed when it was put into my hands. Hmm. Then uh, permit me to read you a portion. Mm -hmm. Here. It is our opinion that the consciences of men ought to ever remain free and unshackled. 
Let every one be unmolested as long as he is modest, as long as his conduct in a political sense is unimpeachable, as long as he does not disturb others or oppose this government. Well, now, where does that leave us, John Bone? That is for you to say, sir. Bone, I'm a rather crotchety old man. I don't pretend to be entirely convinced of the wisdom of this order. But it is an order, and as a soldier, I shall obey it. Perhaps the order is right. What I believe is wrong. Perhaps. But this I know. You're a man of courage. And I respect you for that. And I respect the inspiration of such courage. Whatever it is in your belief that gives your spine starch, your will iron, by my soul, I'd like it. It is not courage. It is truth. Uh -huh. Give it a dozen names. It's still a wondrous virtue. Listen, friend. We're worlds apart in our beliefs. But it's a tiny world. So tiny that two hands can stretch across it. If the will be there. The will is there. My hand on that, Governor Stuyvesant. <laughs> and mine. John Bone, in all respect, I doff my hat to you. Yes, as we said in the beginning of our story, freedom can even wear an insignificant and rather funny hat. Young man, why not let a thought for tomorrow be your thought for today? Consider a future in flying. Yes, your United States Air Force is offering an exciting, exhilarating life to young men who can qualify. If you are between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have completed two or more years of college, and can meet other specific requirements, you can be trained to fly the speedy jets and mighty aircraft of today's air age. You can secure your future in flight. For full details, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>